Thank you, Paul. Um, you, can, um, you can see the title here, Pleasant Dinner Conversation uh, 2. Uh, I had this title last year, Pleasant Dinner Conversation, and I talked about everything but the gold price. Okay. Talked about house prices, uh, Swiss house prices, as it turned out, but they were much lower than London house prices. Uh, I think we talked about uh, uh, Europe and how Europe was constituted, and I thought it would be interesting to give you a Canadian perspective on uh, Europe. I, I don't think that went over very well. Um, but, and um, I might have mentioned something about gold, but um, today, tonight, we're going to talk a lot more about gold because uh, I'm feeling very good about gold, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm actually quite bullish, uh, maybe a little bit more than our models suggest I ought to be. Um, so I'm going to talk about some big issues that will feed into, um, into uh, kind of our price outlook. But before I start, I, I, I overheard there that, that George had just become a Canadian. And I, I want to welcome him to our small community. We're a very large landmass, and we have very few people. So he's, he's making a percentage difference <laughs> to, to what's going on in Canada. And the thing is, he'll be joined by thousands of Americans after November. Okay. <laughs> So, so they'll, all, they'll all be here. Yeah. Okay. Here are my topics. And they all lead into a gold. Okay, so my first point is the U.S. dollar is overvalued. Now, that's been a view of mine for some time, and I'm going to kind of hone in on that a little bit more. Um, and you'll see there the, the second point under that, and U.S. presidential candidates demand that it comes down. I think that's very important. Okay, we're at, a, we're at a point in time where protectionism is back on the rise. Okay, now, we'll talk a little bit more about that when I put that slide. The second one, global economy. You may have seen that the IMF has come out with um, its new forecast and it was revised down. Now, I think, if memory serves me, that's about the sixth semi-annual report in a row where the global growth rate was revised downwards. Okay? It's just the global economy just isn't performing as economists had expected and as had been forecast by the, um, uh, by the uh, IMF. And that raises various issues about policy and how to deal with this slow growth. And, of course, what we're going to talk about a little bit is monetary policy. Okay? Fiscal policy is kind of off the table. And I'll show you why it's off the table. Uh, we've kind of blown it up, fiscal policy, okay? for reasons that confuse me, but anyway. You'll see the charts on that. And so out of that, I come to point three, that gold prices are going to move much higher. Now, one thing I've learned as a, a forecaster is you never give a price and a date. Okay? <laughs> you give a date, oh yeah, there's something will happen, you know, but no price. Or you say, oh, gold prices are going to 10,000, but I'm not telling you when. Right? Somewhere out there. So, so, but I, I will put in some dates and some prices, but this statement is more general. Gold prices are going to go higher. And there are a number of reasons for that that I've listed here. And by the way, uh, you'll be able to download this if you, uh, if you go to our website, which uh, I will give you the, uh, um, the, uh, the link to at the end of this uh, discussion. Uh, note the last sentence, just so that, you know, you say, I don't really want to listen to this guy, okay, but what's the key here? And I said, and gold prices will exceed 2000 in due course, okay, so that's it, fine, I don't want to, I don't need to hear any more, okay, so that's good, but don't talk too loudly to your neighbor while I'm, while I'm, while I'm talking. Okay, let's start with the U.S. dollar. Okay, this is a chart of the U.S. dollar. Now, the unfortunate thing about the U.S. dollar is that we don't actually know how to price it. 
Okay, obviously in Canada, we talk about the U.S. dollar relative to Canadian dollars. So we say the U.S. dollar is uh, whatever, 130, 128, something like that. You know, and you here will say it's uh, whatever, the, the, you know, 96 Swiss to the dollar or, you know, 113 euro, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, but we have to talk about the euro, uh, sorry, the dollar in general. And so what was concocted many years ago was some kind of a trade-weighted formula as to how the U.S. dollar moved from some point in time that you then indexed at 100, and then you say, okay, how much did it change from that point against the yen, against the euro, against important currencies? Important currencies being, I, I look like Bernie, don't I? <laughs> right? Okay. Important currencies being, of course, the currencies that the U.S. trades with. So we call it trade weighted. So if the U.S. dollar goes down like 10 percent uh, on average against this basket, then this thing will go to 90 from 100, right? It just goes down 10 percent. So, so that's what you've got here. Okay, the interesting thing about the chart is that you've had three waves that are up. Now, if you look at your gold price, you'll see that in all these up waves, gold prices went down. So, so, so U.S. dollar is very important for the gold price. Now, there's a simple reason and a complicated reason. The simple reason, the complicated one will take me all night. The, the simple one is that the U.S. dollar is a measuring stick, and if it gets bigger, then everything else shrinks against it, and if it gets smaller, everything else gets bigger against it. So that's the easy way to, to remember this. So when the U.S. dollar goes up, gold prices tend to go down. Now, the U.S. dollar went up in the early 80s uh, for two very simple reasons. The U.S. elected... Reagan and Volcker raised real interest rates to about 10%. Some of you will remember that. Real interest rates, nominal interest rates, close to 20%. Guaranteed, when real interest rates are 10%, very little goes up. Mm -hmm. It's just prices just... And that was, of course, the whole idea. Okay, the second wave, now, I'll tell you what happened at the peak, the U.S. current account balance blew up, and it became a huge political problem. It had a very large um, current account uh, a deficit in the U.S. And so what they decided, Plaza Accord. Anybody remember that name, Plaza Accord? Okay, it was an agreement in late 1985 to devalue the dollar. Well, countries got together, G7 got together, and said, okay, dollar has to go down because the U.S. is upset about the high dollar. Okay, this has relevance to where we are today. Okay, then you have this second leg from 95 to uh, about uh, 2001. Now, what was behind that? Well, you might recall the great tech boom. You here, you everywhere, couldn't shovel enough money into the United States get a piece of the tech boom. Now, I remember the day that it peaked. My sister-in-law in Amsterdam, I was born in Amsterdam, my sister-in-law in Amsterdam phones me up. She has never owned a stock in her life. And she says, my boss tells me I should put 20,000 US dollars into xyz.com. I, I said, don't do it. I hang up. I say to my wife, it's peaked. <laughs> that's it. It's over. Okay. So that's what happened. And the U.S., as you can see, went into recession. Now, the latest rush is a little bit more complicated. Okay? But it has a lot to do with the rest of the world. Actually, very little to do with the U.S., because the U.S. doesn't look that great. Okay? But China slowing down, of course, a mess with respect to the way problems are getting resolved. Actually, they're not getting resolved in Europe and so forth. And of course, as the dollar rises, what I said earlier, you start getting larger trade deficits. And that will end up being um, a problem here. So I've got that red line. I don't know if the red line has already started, that red arrow. Okay, I think it has started, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, that's why I'm an economist. I will tell you two years from now that it went down two years ago when I spoke to you. Okay? Then I know. Okay? But I don't know now. 
but that's what it looks like to me. Okay, what's happening with this dollar going so high? Well, here you've got a kind of a colorful chart. And if you look just at the sort of bottom numbers, because this is an additive chart, you see that the monthly trade deficit numbers of the U.S. are just over 60 billion. That's what this chart says. But the trade deficit in the U.S. is split in two components for this chart's purpose. One is oil, and one is non-oil. Now look at what has happened to the petroleum deficit in the U.S. That's the red bit. You see how that has narrowed? All the improvement, and in fact you haven't actually seen significant improvement in the U.S. trade deficits. It's been flat to getting worse. But all that improvement comes from the oil side. Okay? Because the U.S. is now a large domestic producer. Okay. That's likely to change. But you see what happens to the blue chart here. Okay? That is on a serious downtrend. Now that is trade that the U.S. has with non-oil producers. But just to point out to you, this line here, the squiggly line, is the balance that the U.S. has on petroleum. And you can see there, these numbers are quite uh, large. They're millions of barrels per month. And so I've kind of written in here, at the bottom there, you see 12.7 million barrels a day. At one point, that is what the U.S. was importing. 12.7 million barrels a day. Now, 4.8 million barrels a day. So you can see what's happened there. There's a massive improvement. And it's been godsend for the U.S. economy. Because there's nothing like an investment in a domestic economy that replaces imports. I mean, as an economist, say, give me an investment that replaces imports, right? Or an investment that produces exports. But in this case, replaces imports. So it's been godsend. But you see what's happening. And if you look at the latest data on, you know, the shale industry, you can see the production is stalling. Okay. And that's what you're starting to see now in the import data. So the U.S. oil imports are either going to stabilize or they're going to increase again. Okay, well that brings me to these four charts. This first chart is the U.S. trade balance with the world. It's about 750 billion deficit. Now this is the trade on goods. That's to make the charts com comparable. Services are a slight plus, so you know, I'm, not, I'm not you know, jiggering around with the data. I just want to make the charts somewhat comparable. Now, obviously, there's a large part in that 750 billion that is oil. Okay, now, but there are three regions here that do not sell oil to the U.S. One is China, one is the EU, and the other one is Japan. And these are the deficits that the U.S. runs with China, the EU, and Japan. Okay, now, I take issue with Donald Trump. He says 500 billion is what the deficit is with China. I don't know quite where he got that number. Uh, this, these, these numbers come directly from the, uh, you know, the National Bureau of Economic Research. But we're quibbling. Okay, 400 billion, 500 billion to a politician. You know, when, if you're talking billions, you're not talking money, right? It, it's trillions that make, okay. I find it interesting, particularly being here, that it's such a large deficit with Europe. I said at my presentation at the Denver Gold Group, I said, you know, how on earth do you explain a euro at about 113 for Germany? Germany alone has the single largest current account surplus in the world, and we measure this as a percent of GDP. I mean, it is a total export powerhouse. It has surpassed China. Okay? Germany can operate at a 180 euro to the dollar, and probably ought to. Why is it 113? Because there's a whole bunch of countries in Europe that can't operate properly at 80 cents to the dollar. All right? They need a much lower currency. That's one of the problems you're stuck with. 
Okay, but you know, from a U.S. perspective, they don't give a damn. It's a big deficit with Europe. There's no reason on this chart why the euro should actually go down against the dollar. And if I was advising anyone in the United States, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't put up with it. Now, Japan, it's, you know, it's kind of flattened out. But you can add these numbers up. 390 plus 150 is 540, plus 70 is 610. Three countries have, well, whatever, six out of seven. That's the percentage. Okay, so that's like 75, more than 70, 80 percent doing the quick arithmetic of the U.S. trade deficit right there. Now, I am a big fan of um, an outfit called the Peterson Institute for International Economics. It's a think tank out of Washington, and it focuses on issues that I focus on and that I'm interested in, which is international economic issues. And they periodically do an estimate of what is a fair value for currency. Now, this is complicated because, you know, you move one currency, then that upsets all the other blocks. So it's got to be, it's got to move all together, right? So, for example, China is modestly overvalued on a trade-weighted basis against a whole bunch of currencies. But that doesn't say anything about what China is relative to the U.S. dollar. How do you get to a better balance? Okay, well, what we have here in the last column is a hypothetical. If all the countries of the world ran zero current account deficits, and for those of you that don't follow, is that, that basically means a balanced trade, zero trade. Okay, if all countries did that, how do you get to that? What would be the exchange rates? Well, the Chinese RMB would have to go up by about 36.6% against the U.S. dollar. Now, it would obviously go up, in fact, it would go down against the yen. Okay, see how this works, right? So we, we're looking at it from a U.S. dollar perspective. Okay, Japan would go up 49.9%. So that's basically to 80. Look at the second last column, you see the numbers. China would be 4.54 RMB, and it is currently 6.48, right? 80 for the yen, currently 1, whatever, 13, or 108, you know, somewhere in that, in that range. The euro, 150. In other words, 39.1% up. Now, that's the kind of advice, that's why I put it here, that's the kind of advice that's being given to the five remaining runners, candidates, in the U.S. election. And very recently, Fred Bergsten, who used to be the head of the Peterson, uh, the Peterson Institute for International Economics, put together a chapter in a book that's just come out, and he recalculated all of this. And it turns out it's within 1% of these numbers that we calculated in-house using their models. Okay, so that gives you a sense of just how out of whack it is. Now, that, is, that affects the global economy when currencies are this far out of whack. Right, you say, well, yeah, China, how, how can it live with a 4.5 RMB? Well, it's very difficult to move from 6.4 to 4.5 overnight, right? You know, it's going to take a huge hit. Okay, but that's how it should have happened. It should have, it should have gone slowly higher, because what we need in China is more domestic consumption and less exports. There are many things that need to be done, but one of the things that needs to be done is to give the consumer in China a higher currency. Ditto for Germany. It needs a higher currency. Okay. That's just the fact of life. Okay, now, why will the U.S. dollar go down? It's still kind of on that chart on an uptrend. Well, there are a number of effects that come out from a high currency. I tell you that the Peterson Institute for International Economics calculated that the overvalued dollar has cost the U.S. about four million jobs. Now, if you're a politician, that's important. If you're one of the four million that didn't get the job, it's even more important. Right? So that's kind of how this works. And it dampens GDP. 
Obviously, it dampens GDP directly through what I was just showing you with the, with the trade balance, right? Because exports are lower than imports, and that subtracts in the GDP equation. If imports go up, GDP goes down. That's, that's the identity. Secondly, investments in the U.S., particularly business investment, is rather pathetic. The argument is, why invest in the United States when you can invest elsewhere and have a very competitive place from which to export back to the United States? All right? And so you see that, that that's also happened. That's why it was so godsend for the U.S. to come up with this oil production, because that actually added to investment. That was one of the reasons you got U.S. growth above 2%, because there was this oil investment. That's disappearing. Okay, then you have the Fed, who wants higher inflation. Now, this is a unique thing in the world as well, and I think that's very important if you think about gold. You got pretty well all the central banks, all the major central banks in the world that want higher inflation. Who would have thought, right? I mean, the central bank was always there to keep a lid on inflation, but now they want to boost it. Okay. The high dollar suppresses U.S. inflation. The U.S. is a big importer of deflation because all these other countries are sending stuff to the United States and the prices, are, the prices when you look at it year over year, and we have all this data, they're negative. So the U.S. imports deflation. Okay. That's kind of where the U.S. has been. So this has become a huge political issue now. Right? As to why have we such slow growth, what are the foreigners doing to us, etc., etc. Okay. So you get this rising U.S. protectionism. Okay. And this is a very, very strong force, because one of the things I've learned about looking at the, let's say, the last hundred years or so of, you know, currency history and international economic relations, is that very little gets done unless the big guy on the block puts a big stick on the table and says it's going to be this way or it's the highway. Unfortunately, that's how it is. That's not how it was designed. The IMF was supposed to oversee all these currencies and make sure that they all were reasonably well valued. It hasn't happened that way. So that's what you're getting now. These guys want a weaker dollar. And here are two of them. Okay. Now, if you ask me, I think, I think Bernie is one of the... Now, Bernie is so left that even you might think he's left in Europe, right? <laughs> you, know, you know? I mean, but... In Canada, he would be on the socialist side. That's how left he is. But where he gets his support, well, it's young people and so forth. But, these statements that I have under the picture are taken directly from the, their websites. We will reverse trade policies like NAFTA, China, driven down wages and caused loss of millions of jobs. Well, there's some truth to that. Okay. We need to do all the manufacturing at home. And there you have Trump. We're being blackmailed, right? Now, I happen to quote him here on China, but you know, his favorite attack is Mexico. Now, I didn't put Mexico in there because the trade deficit with Mexico is actually rather minor. I don't know what the issue is with Mexico. I am, I am one of the snowbird types in Canada, and the snowbirds in Canada leave about November, and they go to Florida or Arizona or California, and they winter there. And I'll tell you one thing. Nothing gets done in these areas if it weren't for the Mexicans that are there. Okay. okay, so it's just, that is how it is. Okay, so there's some, there's some pie in the sky theory about, okay, send them all home and all the low income whites will fill the jobs? Forget it. Okay, because we have entitlements. You don't need to work. Anyways, this is what you got. And then you have these other guys. Okay. Ted Cruz. Now, Ted Cruz actually has a very interesting fiscal policy. Flat taxes, value, uh, uh, sort of a VAT, uh, a consumption tax, zero corporate tax, exactly off my playbook. That's what is needed. 
But then he gets into social policy. You don't want to deal with him on social policy. Even I, who is to the right of Attila the Hun, don't want to deal with his views on social policy. Hillary, yeah, I don't know what to say about Hillary. I don't know what your, your impression is, but I, I do remember there was a statement about one of the Japanese prime ministers some years ago. They called him a weather vane. So whichever way the wind blows, that's the way that vein is pointed. Okay. That's kind of my impression of Clinton. It doesn't much matter what the policy is as long as I'm leading it. Okay. That, 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 that's my sense of it. But, you know, obviously I have my biases. If I'd have my druthers, I'd have this guy below here, John Casey, come up the middle, but he's not presidential enough. And he hasn't been able to win too many primaries. In fact, one, his home state. Okay, so, but it, the more important thing is, all five of them have this idea, fair trade. Now, when you hear someone say fair trade, you say, oh God, that's some, you know, that's some wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, meaning protectionism. Well, yes and no. I, I actually believe in fair trade, and the way I interpret it is apply the same policies to what is coming into your country as the other countries are applying to your exports to that country. Now, let me give you an example of this. And this is a Canadian example. It's one of my favorite examples. Some years ago, back in the 70s, um, you know, I'm pretty old, so I talk about in the 70s, um, the U.S. negotiated with Japan something called voluntary export restraint limits on the cars that Japan was shipping to the U.S. The U.S. didn't want to put a tariff barrier up. It wanted Japan to limit the cars it sold to the U.S. voluntarily itself. Now, how good is that? It doesn't break any law. It fits with whatever WTO, or in those days, um, uh, GATT, not GATT, uh, GATT, right? Uh, so that was fine. The Canadian trade minister goes over to Japan shortly thereafter and says, you know, that's a great thing. We'd like it too. All right? We don't want you to ship all your excess cars to Canada now. And the Japanese kind of said to Canada, who the heck are you? Right? I mean, like, you know, you got two people living in Canada, right? You, you don't count. Right? You, you don't even add up to California. So what did the trade minister do? He applied the same policies that Japan applied to its imports to the cars coming from Japan to Canada. Now, what Japan did for many years is individual item checking. In fact, it was so bad that, that agricultural products would rot on the dock because a customs agent hadn't gotten around to checking it yet. Individual item checking. What we do, and most developed country, most countries do, is you have batch checking. The boat comes in, I'll take that car. That car, you look at it, yes, it meets specifications, the boat comes in. So Canada decided to check every car. Okay, there were pictures in the paper of about 40 ships backed up in English Bay in Vancouver from Japan. There weren't enough customs people to check all that stuff through. Japan caved. That is fair trade. You see? You see how this works? <laughs> it's very interesting. You don't want to let our product in. Well, okay, we had an, another issue in Canada. I, just, and I, I won't go too much about Canada on this one. But, you know, the, the Chinese, one of the Chinese um, investment corporations wanted to buy some oil installations in Alberta. And this was a big problem in Ottawa. How do we deal with this? What do we do? With... What is the big deal? Say, of course you can invest in Canada, provided that the rules that we apply to your investment are exactly the same rules you apply to our investments in your country. See how fair trade works? Now, it gets nasty, because everybody has slightly different. But that's, that's what's coming at you. Now, you say, oh, well, this is the U.S. Well, I just thought I'd throw a few pictures out. Some of you will recognize these people, right? Uh, I particularly like Gert Wilders, the guy in the middle there with the nose. Uh, that's because I'm Dutch by birth, so I focus on... But 
There are a number of people, and, and, and it isn't just in the U.S. This is now a global thing. You know, we've had a phenomenal explosion in international trade and globalization, and it has, it has seriously moved production and employment around. And so there is now a reaction to this. And of course, in Europe, you also have reactions to other quasi-globalized uh, issues. Okay, so, <clears throat> about the dollar. When the dollar turns down, gold goes up. Okay, you won't see that from this chart, because I've got the U.S. dollar inverted. Okay, in other words, when that blue line goes down, the dollar is actually going up. Now, you look at where I've got those red and green lines, and you'll see that they all line up pretty closely. So, one of your most important variables in gold is what the U.S. dollar is doing. And if the U.S. dollar is turning, so is the gold price. Okay? Interestingly, we can see this for silver, we can see it for copper, we can even see it for oil. Surprise, surprise. Okay, and the issue isn't that complicated. It deals again to the U.S. dollar being that measuring stick. All right? But it has an impact. So this is over and above the supply-demand fundamentals. Now, I'm not big on the supply-demand fun fundamentals of gold. They don't actually matter that much. But they obviously do in oil. But even there, you will see this kind of relationship play out. So our view, the U.S. dollar is going lower, and that is going to be positive uh, for gold. Okay, the global economy. Well, these are some charts that are just updated by the IMF's latest uh, numbers, and so the first little chart gives you the, um, the forecast from the I IMF. 3.2% growth in the global economy for 2016 and 35 in 2017. Those are both down, of course, again, from the World Economic Outlook last October. And you see India, and you see the euro area. The euro area is coming around uh, kind of 1.5% or so. Okay, so that's fine. The U.S. Okay, now this is not an IMF forecast, but I want to kind of back into the U.S. a little bit. Now what I've got here are quarterly growth rates, seasonally adjusted annualized rates and so forth, for about the last 16 years, going back to the recession of 1991. And what you'll see there in the red is 3.7% growth average between the recession of 91 and 0102, 2.7% between the next two recessions, and now 2.1%. One of the best forecasts I made, I always, I always tell everybody my worst forecast. My worst forecast, see, it, it irritates me so much that I got to get it off. My but I, my worst forecast in 2010, I think, or 2011, whenever the, Greek, the Greeks was having an election in May, okay, which is almost every year, so that's why I can't remember, right? But Greece is out of the euro 80% probability. What a miss. Now, in retrospect, you read all the little nuances of the negotiations, and hey, that actually wasn't a bad percentage, right? It was, the, it was very close. But, but the good forecast I made after the last recession, I called it when it would end, and I would say, and the U.S. would grow indefinitely at about 2%. Right? So that's kind of what, what we have seen. But more importantly, this is how things look by decade. Right? Now, ask, someone asked a question about productivity, and that runs through this. Okay? Growth in the 40s was around 6%. Growth now is around 2%. Okay? There's a secular decline in real growth, and it isn't just in the U.S. Yeah? Now, this is, this is troubling, and it's troubling for a very simple reason other than employment. You need growth to pay those like me who are going to retire, right? Because that's been promised to me, and damn it, I insist on getting it. I tell you, half the United States insists upon getting it, whether they need it or not. Okay, and I don't even want to talk about the entitlement structure here. 
not in Switzerland per se, but generically in Europe. Okay, but you got this other thing going on, and I've included China here because I, I put this chart together, updated it for when I was speaking in uh, Shanghai uh, in December. What we have here is um, super aged. So that is the ratio of people over 65 to those between 14, uh, 15 and 64. Okay, so that's just a kind of a, a demographic development. And you can see that Japan is already super aged. Um, I have Western Europe. It turns out that Germany is now super aged. Okay? So it goes. That's the way we're moving. And this is demographics. There's very little we can do about that. Well, in fact, there's nothing we can do about that. And this is one of my favorite charts. It is a breakdown of the U.S. budget. And it's broken down into four very simple categories. Let's start with other. Okay? That's running of the government, fixing dikes that break, infrastructure, you name it. That's other. Interest on the debt, well, it's come down thanks to the Fed. I'm not saying that the Fed is engineered it this way. When you have weak growth, you have low interest rates. You know, that's just the nature. Defense. Now notice that defense back in 1970 was squeakly, just if you go a bit earlier, a little further back, it's clear. Defense was the single largest item in the U.S. deficit, in the U.S. budget. Now me, as I said, to the right of Attila the Hun, that's how I believe the world should be. That's the first role of the government is to defend us. Note Europe. This is a huge issue, by the way, over on the other side. The spending of money on NATO by Europe. Finally, somebody has put it on the table because it's been smoldering for years. All right. But anyway, that's how it is. But now, entitlements. Okay, over 60%. Now, I, I, I might have mentioned this last year because, as I said, it's one of my favorite charts. But I showed this chart a few years ago, um, when I was doing some rounds in, uh, in New York, and I was meeting some uh, press people, and there was a lady from Barron's. And, uh, you know, talk about this and that, and I said, here, this is the way the government spends its money. She said, Martin, you're wrong. I said, how do you mean I'm wrong? You've made a mistake. That's probably Canada or Europe. God knows they're all socialists, right? I said, no, this is the U.S., and we actually sent all the data from the, and that's, that's it. Now, this is just the U.S., but every country is in this, every developed country is in this situation. And so what that means now, you've got these forces coming at you. Weak growth, right? Rising super-aged, high entitlements. What's that going to do to government debt? Well, it's not entirely coincidental that the highest debt ratio in the world is in Japan. It's also the most super-aged. Okay? And so it goes. Now, I've got a line here at 90% because Reinhard and Rogoff, in a book that's entitled This Time is Different, said that when you get over 90%, you're on a slippery slope. Your growth starts to weaken, your cost of def uh, 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 servicing the debt and so rises, etc., etc. This is a very difficult thing to get off. How you do it, on paper, is dead simple. Have 10% nominal growth and fix your interest rate at 2%. You will get out of your debt problems pretty quickly. Okay? You need rapid growth and low interest rates. There's a problem. We don't have rapid growth. China, actually, is not immune to this. Now, it turns out that Chinese government debt is only about 55% of GDP, but China's, shall we say, quasi-government debt is over 125%. Right? That's, and so China, actually, is among the highest debt ratio countries in the world. That's not generally known. This is taken from the... Uh, uh, the McKinsey report on, uh, on global debt. Okay, so what do we do? 
Well, there's two ways to go with that. Default, have a depression, and you know, suffer it through. And that actually is how it was done, let's say, prior to the Second World War and back into the 1800s. If you check the, the, um, the cycles, the economic cycles back in the 1800s, depressions were common because you didn't have fiscal policy and you didn't have monetary policy and you didn't have an exchange rate policy because everything was stuck to gold. Right? So you just suffered it through. So that's the bottom bit there, austerity. Within the European system, that's what's being recommended. Well, good luck with that. In history, people don't really buy into this because austerity domestically means domestic wages and prices have to go down. And human beings don't accept that very easily. There's been a number of studies on the Depression. One I remember years and years ago was that companies that had flexible wages and prices retained about 95% of their labor. Companies that had no flexibility in wages and prices retained about 35% of their labor. Get high unemployment. So austerity is not something that people will vote for. So you get to the other side, reflation. Go for inflationary growth. Now, if you listen to all the central bankers, that's what they're saying. So how, how's that gone? Well, ZIRP. Okay, that, everybody knows what that is. Zero interest rate policies. So I can't write it all down. QE, quantitative easing. This is sequential. We start it with zero, then we go to QE, then we go to NIRP, negative interest rate policies. Okay, that's where we're stuck now, negative interest rate policies. The big discussion at the moment is helicopter money. So that's the direction that policy is taking. So let's talk a little bit about that. We've seen QE, and it's still being done by the ECB and by the Bank of Japan. The Fed has given up on it. That's it. We've got four trillion or so in, you know, in, in assets. About two and a half trillion are, uh, you know, excess reserves in the banking system. Enough is enough. That's been the attitude as of late by the, uh, the Federal Reserve um, FOMC members. Okay. The first chart here, the big one, policy rates. You see how close they're hugging zero. No one expected this. I, I, I saw, I think it was this morning, um, uh, Mervyn King, the ex-Bank of England governor, being interviewed on Bloomberg, and he said, you know, nobody expected in 2009 and 2010, that we would be looking at zero or negative interest rates for the next five or six years. That, that was not part of a central bank thinking. There we are. Okay. And of course, on the other side, the 10-year bond yields have come down to levels that I actually have to go back. I think somewhere in 1700, there was an interest rate that was of some lengthy maturity that might have been lower than what we're seeing now. But this is totally outside of expectations. And this is a chart that I borrowed from the, um, the Telegraph, who borrowed it from BlackRock and JP Morgan. This is the total amount of money, right, that is earning less than zero percent, and it's issued by governments. Now, it's all maturities. It's over seven trillion. You note a little comment down below there. The argument that gold pays no interest kind of loses its punch, right? Because that was, as you know, one of the great arguments against gold. But we now have a very, very sizable market that pays negative interest rates. Okay, helicopter money. Patrick said, be sure to talk about helicopter money. I say, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good thing. I'm a big fan of Milton Friedman, and he kind of coined the term. Keynes also knew about helicopter money, but he called it bottled money. Some of you might recall that. One of the things he said was the way to deal with the Depression is governments put money into bottles and bury them and then let people dig them up. Okay? Same idea. Okay? So basically what, 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 what Friedman said, suppose you fly a plane over the system and it drops $1,000 bills. People will 
get these bills and they'll start to spend them. The key here, it's debt-free money. You don't have to pay it back. And so the question is, how do you shovel this out? Well, there are umpteen ways to do this. Right? Obviously, you can fly a plane and drop money, but that's not necessarily fair. I'm, I'm maybe faster than you, or you're faster than me. You collect more $1,000 bills than I do. And by the way, the $1,000 bill's already been out, and now they're talking about moving the $500 bill out, because, hey, that's, you know, that's all um, a way for you to escape the system is to hoard money like this. Anyways, there's a number of ways you can inject it. Uh, central bankers can simply provide the money to the government who give it back as a kind of a tax rebate, right? Or uh, just dump it into individual accounts. And if you had electronic banking, that would be very simply done. Put it in there. The central banks can buy debt of the government or non-government organizations but debt that actually doesn't have to be paid back, and there's no interest. Okay, it's here. Here's money, go and build that dam that you've been threatening, right? So, you see, it's also partly a bit of fiscal policy that comes into play here when you do this, if you, if you go that route. Or some have suggested the central banks can just simply write down the holdings of government debt. Now, that'd be interesting in the United States, because the Fed holds, whatever, three trillion U.S. bonds, you say, oh, write them off. Well, that saves the U.S. government, obviously, a certain amount of money so that they can do something else with that. Anyways, this is as open as you'd like it to be. Okay? The problem with helicopter money is that history does not reflect well on it. <laughs> okay? And the two obvious examples that immediately come to mind, because I have some of those notes in my office, is Zimbabwe money back a decade ago. I think I, I have a note that's the single largest note ever printed, and it's 100 trillion Zimbabwe dollars. I think that's the denomination. There's so many zeros there, you, 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 lose, you lose track of that. It happened once when I was, I was in Turkey, and I had a cup of coffee there at, 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 at a restaurant, and I got a bill, and it was 2.5 million lira. And I thought to myself, how do you get to this point, right? And I paid 25 million because I, I kept the wrong zeros. You know, anyways, so that's one of the things. So this funding, this open funding that is basically opening the tap from a central bank against no promise to repay. It can be very dangerous, and obviously uh, the first famous one that you and I would have come across in, in, in our uh, uh, schooling is the Weimar Republic. Right? Same idea. So I got this red point here, need we say that helicopter money is very positive for gold? Now, I think that goes without saying. Now, I don't, I don't want to suggest that helicopter money is automatically going to generate a whole bunch of inflation, hyperinflation. In fact, the reason they're discussing it is because they want some inflation. All right. We'll see. Ben Bernanke said in one of his latest pieces from the Brookings Institute, don't take it off the table. So, we'll follow that out. Okay, so all of this kind of, in a roundabout way, comes to gold. Negative interest rates. Well, here you have a chart of the gold price with, with real long-term interest rates, but the real long-term interest rate is inverted, and we call it the TIPS, the 10-year uh, treasury, the treasury uh, uh, protected, um, inflation protected security. All right. You can see that very recently, the TIPS yield has gone back towards zero. Okay. That's all part and parcel of the movement that we're seeing at the central bank sector. This is the real interest rate on the short-term side for the U.S. Now, this is not in, uh, flipped over because I'm not comparing it to gold here. And you can see that for the last, uh, oh, at least 10 years, real short-term interest rates in the United States have been negative. Now, very recently, they have risen. And one could argue that that rise from 
uh, you know, 2012 to now, maybe had some impact on the gold price. Right? But the very recent the, uh, rise in real short term is because inflation numbers have gotten a little higher in the United States. Some of the oil negatives have moved out of inflation. Uh, sorry, they went down. And what you're now going to get is inflation is going to pick up because some of the oil price things are going to uh, move out. And so actually, I expect this thing to go back to around minus 1.5%. If you look at this, what they call the dot plot from the Federal Reserve, this is the estimates of the various members of the Federal Reserve, thinking about what would interest rates be and what would inflation rate and so be, you'll come around very quickly to see that no one at the Fed, uh, Federal Reserve expects positive real short-term interest rates before 2017 at the earliest. Okay. So how does that, how do those two things factor into it? Well, investors are starting to take note. Okay, you need, you know, eco you know, there's this old joke in economics, you know, and a couple of economists are, are walking there and somebody, uh, one of them sees a $10 bill lying on the street and the other guy says, hey, you know, that's a $10 bill on the street. We should pick it up. And the other guy says, no, that's, that's not a $10 bill that's lying on the street. If that was a real $10 bill, somebody would have already picked it up, right? As economists have theories, but you need business people. You need the active, you know, uh, you know the, the, the animal spirits to actually make it happen. So this is a measure of the animal spirits. You got this background of negative interest rates and so forth. And suddenly, you have started to see some buying of ETF. In fact, the first significant buying since 2012. I wanted to say on this chart, we had a meltdown in 2013. Maybe this year we get a melt up. We'll see. Okay? But that's kind of the animal spirits as I see them there. Okay? That, that you and I collectively are beginning to say, hey, this is, this is not going in the right direction with all this nonsense interest rates. I mean, there's all, all kinds of theories also about, you know, that negative interest rates really don't work well. Okay? I mean, they, they can be quite damaging to an economy. Okay, so you got that. So you got some demand coming in on the gold side. So obviously the next question would be, well, what about supply? Okay, well, you got three components of supply. The first chart is mine production. Now, you see the red line there. It has a slight upward trend. And I'm not going to endear myself to the miners here. Our model of mine supply, global mine supply, keeps pointing to a continued modest increase in mine output. It takes up to 14 years for the system to react to low prices. I know we all want to say, oh, you know, we have low prices, you know, we're cutting back. It takes a long time to do that. To be honest, 50 tons or so doesn't mean very much of this. Now, the second part of the supply is Scrap supply, that's recycled. That's flat, and the lower gold prices are, that reacts fairly quickly, so you lose scrap supply. The higher gold price goes, the more scrap supply comes into the market. And then the third component is central banks. Now, why do I put central banks in here? Okay, it's very simple. Central banks come to the table before you and I and take their piece. What is left on the table gets allocated between investors and jewelers. Huh? So I do not look at central bank as I, it's obviously part of supply when they're selling, right? Because the market, if you will, has to pick up that gold. But when they're buying, they're subtracting the available from the available supply for minor, uh, for uh, uh, investors and uh, and, and jewelers. And I put that differently. Here you see it all work together, and you see that long run trend now? It's downward sloping. So that I do believe in. That the gold supply available for you and I to buy is going down. Now that raises a question. Because we think that the central bankers are going to be buying for years and years, so in other words, that supply will go down. China is buying more gold, 
and we think that China is on a long-run target, I've got a circle here around this number 12,626. That's the number that is calculated if you hypothesize that China would like to have about 15% of its global foreign exchange reserves in gold. Now it has about let's say 1,700 to 1,800 tons that it is officially published. That's what it needs, 1,200. So in other words, there is over 10,000 tons that China would have to buy. That is the deficiency in gold. Now that's if China chooses it. I believe that China is on that path. Okay, and I, when I, I mentioned earlier I was in Shanghai, that is certainly what I heard the officials in Shanghai, because when you go to a, a Chinese conference, you know, there are two non-government speakers and the rest are government speakers, right? And that's what they say, that this is where we want to go, and that's what I heard them say. So I paid close attention, and very much the number 5,000 tons came up. That's where they like to go as a first step. And of course, the next step is 8,000, because that's what the U.S. holds, and we'll see thereafter. So that's the direction that we're going to see going that way. Russia, same idea. Okay? These countries also take the view that the gold in our reserves are not, the gold reserves are not liabilities of the Federal Reserve. And that has positives, geopolitical positives. I had a whole theory that I developed back in the 80s about what's going to happen to currency blocks and so forth. And the centers of the currency blocks, those central banks, were going to want to hold more gold over time. And I see that happening. So I think that's gone. And then you have rising incomes in India and China. Now, rising incomes means more gold demand. And now I have a problem. I've got this red line that is rising, right? They say, well, what's your problem? Okay, the problem is an economic one. You can't have more demand than supply. And I always say this to the World Gold Council. You know, you want to you wanna also point this out, that you can't just have demand rise willy-nilly if supply isn't rising, right? How does the market work this out? Okay, we're back in Econ 101. The first chart. You got a supply line that is upward sloping, you got a demand line that is downward sloping. You get richer, the way we look at this in economics is that downward sloping black line shifts like that red arrow, it shifts outward. Okay. So you would think you're going to go from Q1 to Q1A. That's how much gold you think you're going to take up because the demand has shifted out. But supply says we can't supply that much gold at that P1 price. So you go to the second chart. And that becomes your new quotes equilibrium. The price rises significantly and you move from Q1 to Q2. So in other words, your demand the amount of gold taken off rises only a little bit, and what governs that is how much supply you can add when the price goes up. You follow me? So that's what richer India and China will do. It's not that they will take up more gold, not unless you're producing a lot more gold. They're going to be driving the price higher. Marketing does the same thing. Better channels of distribution in the gold markets do this. Makes gold more available, more demand, but not more supply, ergo the price must rise. That's how this, this all hangs together. Other issue here, I'm a believer in the long commodity cycle. Now here I have a chart of copper prices, real copper prices going back to 1850. And I put red lines and green lines, the red line being the, the peak of the price cycle and the green line being the bottom of the price cycle. It takes a PhD to do this, just so that you know that, okay? Because I have to add up the years and then look at it carefully and draw some lines and that's it. It turns out that the shortest distance between the red line and the green line, so you see there's a very high level of work here, 
The shortest distance between the red line and the green line is 16 years. That's the shortest half cycle in the history of copper prices. If copper prices are finished now, that is it, the cycle is over, it's done, finished. We're going into a bear cycle, which is what many, up until maybe three months ago, were arguing, and I was not, but if that was the case, this would be what we have just seen, the shortest cycle in copper in absolute history, as far as we have recorded data on the copper price. Now, I cannot possibly argue that that would be the case, given all the things that are going on in the world, where India is going, where China is going, where Southeast Asia is going, the way we're going to go into, uh, you know, uh, whatever, uh, 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 electric, electrically driven cars, etc., etc. The copper demand has to go up. Okay? Doesn't necessarily have to happen today, but that's the longer run view. And part of my support, I used to use a slide that uh, Robert Friedland had, because you listen to Robert Friedland for 10 minutes and you basically say, well, where do I buy, right? I mean, the man is, is a total salesman in the sense of he presents so well that the case is made. But I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put another slide up, because maybe you've seen this slide. This is... The, the blue bit is what the American Society of Civil Engineers has estimated the U.S. will need in infrastructural projects between 2013 and 2020, and it's 3.6 trillion. Okay, now we have lots of time, I show you some nice pictures of divers in the New York subway, because they got flooded and you had to have divers go down and check things. Okay, I mean, is it, infrastructure in the United States is a bit of a mess, I'm, I'm sure that uh, but the OECD uh, McKinsey has estimated that the global community requires something like 57 trillion between 2013 and 2030. Now, what is, what is infrastructure? It's stuff. It's demand for stuff. And so that's why I think that. On gold, the long cycle is a little bit harder to sort of ferret out. The shortest up cycle in fact, the shortest half cycle at all was 10 years, from basically 1970 to 1980. So there's no chartist argument here that gold prices have to go into a second leg. Okay, my argument is that what we've seen in gold, and that's been an argument for some time, is that gold is going through a big correction, much like it did in the middle 1970s. Okay? In the middle 70s, it was a little shorter. This time, it's a little bit longer. But the degree of decline is about the same. In fact, in 74, 74 to 76, it was a 49 point something percent decline in the price of gold. So that would be from 1900 to 1000. Okay, we're close, but that's it. So th I think we're there. Here is an interesting chart which a gold bull would maybe want to have a closer look at. Not me, agnostic economist, right? Um, the blue line is the nominal price of gold. So that's just, you know, your, the price as it was on the days that you're charting. Okay, and then, this is monthly averages. That's why you don't see that 850, because that was a one day PM fix, 850. All right, the gold line is the nominal price back calculated in today's money using first quarter 2016 CPI index for the US. And there you can see that the peak price in 1980 was over 2000. I have not deviated at all through this whole four year period from the view that eventually that 2000 will be taken out. Okay? It's just, I can't be specific, you know? We'll see how it goes. But what we have seen develop on the debt, like these are glaciers moving. They just keep getting closer and closer, and the problems are getting larger and larger. And we don't know how to solve them other than by putting more money into the system. So that's why I think that. Now here is a really interesting chart. So this is your dessert. Okay. I am not a technical analyst, but you know, what the heck, let's throw it out there. 
This is the log gold price. And I basically drawn trend lines from 35 to 255 out. And then I have drawn parallel lines at the top. And you can calculate out what then the points would be where you hit those lines. See, so 1895 was your, your high um, uh, uh, PM fix. And so that would correspond to about 195, which was the high before gold dropped sharply in the middle 70s. And then you say, okay, well now, if gold were to do exactly what it did it now, what it did in the second half of the 70s, then we're looking at 8,100. Could it go to 8,000? I say, who knows? I mean, this is, you know, this, this is charting extraordinaire. Okay? That's not something we're forecasting. But, you know, once a year I look at this chart and I thought, because we're feeling more comfortable about gold, why don't we um, uh, throw it out there? What am I forecasting? This is my last slide. Um, this is what I said at the, uh, at the gold conference. We do it as a good economist. We have three hands, not two hands. Yeah. On the one hand, on the other, and on the third hand. Scenario A is what you might quickly uh, interpret to be the, the Goldman Sachs scenario. The US dollar doesn't go down. The Fed does raise interest rates rather more than what the market expects. Okay? And you can see how, what I think of that scenario. I put, that's my subjective view, 10 to 15% on that sort of scenario. Okay? It's not a zero probability, it's just not a high probability, in my view. Obviously, people at Goldman Sachs think differently. Scenario C is where my biases lie, and you can see that I have 40 to 50%. So that all works out when you do the probability and you weight it all up at about 12.23 as an average for this year, and I always, well always, uh, in recent years I've added in a little bit for geopolitical and financial crisis. And so my final number for this year average would be 1248. And you say, oh my gosh, that doesn't sound so interesting. But you know, you got to be a little bit careful. The second and uh, third quarters of the year, um, you know, they, they, they get a little difficult for, for, for prices, at least season, seasonally. So we'll see. I, it, th this may not happen. I am biased to C, and C definitely has better prices into 2017. And okay, now what, what is in C? is basically what I suggested there. Very loose monetary policies and the US dollar rolling over and no particular issues on the supply side. Okay. Now, I can I tell you what I forecast last year. If I could shift the year 2016 backwards two months, I would have had an absolutely beautiful forecast because last year, at this time, I forecast that the year-end gold price would be two. I think it was two eight, uh, 1280. It ended at 1060. Ooh, I missed that. Move this year backwards two months, and look what the gold price was at the end of February. I'd say, boy, that was a pretty good forecast. Anyway, that's what I think, and so this is how you can avail yourself of our reports. And I am sure that I have talked much too long. Thank you very much.